Hello everyone and welcome to our first lecture in chapter 6, the second chapter within the unit on our legislative branch. And in this one, as you guys can tell, we're going to talk about the constitutional powers that reside with our legislative branch. So let's get started. All right, so let's set the stage a little bit and go way back to some stuff that we talked about in chapter three, just a little bit of review for you guys. So if you remember, article one of our constitution deals specifically with the legislative branch, its organization, its powers, and so forth. But if you go to section eight and then review uh, clauses numbers one through 18, it actually specifically talks about the powers Congress has. Um, and in these, you have express powers, which we call the enumerated powers sometimes within this clause because they're numbered 1 through 18. Um, and the last clause, number 18, is what we call the necessary and proper clause. And it's, it's used to carry out all our powers of the legislative branch. And the, another name for it is the elastic clause. If you guys remember back, we talked about with the example of a slinky. It gives it that flexibility. Um, allowing to go back and forth and do what you need to do. Um, or if you want to even remember the Ace Ventura <laughs> clip uh, with the slinky going down the mountainside steps. Okay, and then if you remember, implied powers are powers that Congress has um, or allow Congress to meet the needs of a growing nation and help them carry out their express powers. All right, so when we, we look at the constitutional provisions or powers that Congress has um, through when it was first created with the adoption of our Constitution even to now we have conflicting interpretations and it primarily has to do with the interpretation people have and whether it should be a strict interpretation of the Constitution such as okay it doesn't exactly say that then they can't have it or a loose interpretation alluding to the fact well it mentions this type of uh, issue and this falls under that so um, one of the first instances where this actually came up where there's a conflict of strict versus loose interpretation if you guys remember we we did that whole case study on McCullough versus Maryland and whether or not the Constitution should be loosely interpreted versus strictly interpreted and as you guys can remember the, the Supreme Court decided that it, there's a loose interpretation or it set up a loose interpretation based on the ruling in McCullough versus Marin, Maryland in that Congress does have the power to charter a bank um, because it deals with commerce and so forth and taxing powers within its, its jurisdiction. Now, there are powers that are denied to Congress. Um, they're limited by exactly what the Bill of Rights says. You cannot take anything away from anybody. That's a right given to them in the Bill of Rights. Um, the writ of habeas corpus it cannot be suspended. Um, and they also can't post uh, bills of, of attainder or ex post facto laws. Now, we won't get into that because that's not for really for this course. It's for another one. But as you guys remember, we, we've mentioned before uh, or talked about before in class that there is an exception to almost any rule um, that's put in our government. And generally that exception to the rule, as you can see Abraham Lincoln here, is the Civil War. Um, and in the early days of the Civil War, he did suspend the writ of habeas corpus for many people, um, primarily in the border states, um, for a portion of time so that when those border states would actually cast their vote for secession, they jailed and suspended that writ until that vo vote was over and then they let him go. So there are examples of where, even though denied powers are there, they're still being used. But again, it's few and far between, and generally our exception is the Civil War. Okay, now, on to some more specific powers um, that con constitutionally our legislative branch gets. They get taxing and spending powers, or what we call power of the purse. Um, generally, these are powers that allow them to regulate the economy um, in terms of money going in or providing the wealth for, welfare for the people and determining where money is going to go within the government. All right, other money powers is they can borrow money to cover operating expenses. This is what we get, or one of the main areas where we get our national debt from. And this can be throughout any number of avenues in terms of where we need to borrow money to cover expenses. Um, and they can also make laws over bankruptcy, but generally, if you look at bankruptcy laws, they're, they're more left up to the states. Okay, 
Some other powers are commerce powers. Now, this is specifically laid out in Clause 3 of Section 8, or number 3 of our enumerated powers. And basically, Congress has the ability to regulate commerce. Um, an example of this would be minimum wage, because that has to do with trade. It has to do with how much money people make at a minimum um, level. Now, regulating commerce can be done either domestically or interstate, as you see on the screen, or with foreign powers, so that it covers both realms there. Um, and you can see that through time, this power has been consistently expanded by the Supreme Court. The reason why is primarily through the idea that commerce allows um, money to come in or go out, or products to go in, come in or go out, and therefore you're expanding it so that the economically the, the country can have a little bit more freedom and be a little bit, um, or not a little bit, but a lot stronger in terms of their economy and trade. And if you remember back um, in Chapter 4, we talked about another example in terms of where Congress could actually use these powers to pass laws and other avenues, such as in the Civil Rights Movement. That's why the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, is because they viewed, hey, look, discrimination is pulling back or hurting commerce, and we have the right to, to determine over commerce. So they could actually pass laws based on um, the civil rights movement, if you guys remember back to that. Now, the next area of power uh, exists with foreign policy. We already kind of talked a little bit about that with the commerce power, because they deal with foreign trade. Um, but this is more about in terms of declaring war, signing treaties. Um, now, trade agreements would go with power, uh, commerce powers and be connected. Um, creating or maintaining armed forces are laid out in terms of foreign policy because you need using the military for protection against foreign um, issues or groups is another aspect that would be shared there. Um, this is shared with the president. Uh, obviously, this is shared with the president in the, in the fact that one of the president's main powers is he is the commander-in-chief of the U.S. military. Um, and typically where you can see uh, two areas of conflict um, between our Congress and the president in terms of how to use the military or dictate foreign policy would have to do with the Korean War in Vietnam, primarily in terms of restrictions in terms of what a person, what the president should be able to do and what they shouldn't be able to do, how they should conduct the war. And this was more evident in Vietnam, um, judging by... Uh, some of the actions that happened in the war in terms of what the president wanted to do versus um, what Congress was trying to do. And it was all more complicated when you added in the public opinion towards the war. Um, an example of what I'm talking about would be the passage of the War Powers Act in 1973. This was towards the tail end of the Vietnam War um, when Nixon was president. And they Congress said, hey, look, you're, they knew that he was overstepping his bounds. Um, in certain ways, and they were fighting with them a little bit, and they passed this act saying the president cannot commit forces um, for more than 60 days overseas without a declaration of war in terms of if it's for something for um, in war purposes or conflict. Now, since then, our presidents have tried to test this theory, um, well, or, or this act. How? Well, it depends on the conflict. Um, for example, back um, after September 11th and, and then our invasions and, and, and so forth into um, Afghanistan and Iraq, there was a time that George W. Bush actually did not have a declaration of war, and that was a question in terms of whether he was going to have to pull the troops out after 60 days. Now, he's able to get that eventually um, before the 60 days, but it was a question. All right. Now, here's some powers that allow our Congress to adapt for our growing nation. And this is important because it's in a, it, these powers are um, allow, it, allow the country to change and adapt with the times. Um, one is the power of naturalization. If you guys remember, naturalization is, is the process of having people come in from other areas or other countries and then becoming U.S. citizens. They're naturalized as U.S. citizens. Um, and that's important because of the history of our country, where people have come from, we're a melting pot, and we've welcomed, although in a lot of instances we haven't welcomed people from other places um, in our history. Um, the next part is admit, admittance of new states or governing uh, of territories. So we've talked about enabling acts previously in this course. Um, Congress has this, starts that, that process in terms of um, states getting admitted, at least at the federal end. 
Um, and then they have a setup in terms of powers to govern the territories of the United States, whether it's Puerto Rico, um, Guam, American Samoa, and so forth, as many others. Okay, um, they also have the powers to grant over copyrights, um, and then they can create federal courts if they need to and post offices. Now, copyrights and patents, this is just for your guys' own information. Um, a copyright is, is the life of the person that gets it plus 50 years after their death. And then um, patents are 17 years until somebody can actually start reproducing um, that um, good. Now, some non-legislative powers, we just have a couple more slides left here, um, is in terms of choosing a president. Um, if there's no defining majority in the electoral college, then the vote actually gets split off into the House of Representatives and the Senate. Now, the House would choose the president and the Senate would choose the vice president. Now, where this has been a real big question is in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr actually had an agreement that they, through voting and, and campaigning, that Aaron Burr would actually become Thomas Jefferson's vice president. But the whole idea was is that he, they both believed that Aaron Burr would never even get enough votes um, to even challenge Jefferson. However, he was, he was able to get enough to tie him, and this is before we had them um, together on a ballot. So technically, the second place person would become the vice president. That's why the agreement was in place. But Aaron Burr started to renege on that, uh, that deal. It became a debate in terms of who would actually become president because Jefferson didn't have the backing of Congress because he was a Democratic Republican. Congress was Federalist. Now they ended up making a deal. Thomas Jefferson did become president. Now, this led to the 12th Amendment, where we separated um, the first and second place votes in terms of president and vice president, and now you have them in their current situation where they're on their own ticket. And then in 1824, um, this was also a, a debate because we just started having um, the popular vote, but it wasn't com completely um, across all states. And there wasn't a defining majority in terms of who should become president based on the Electoral College, and they had to vote. And again, there was some animosity between certain candidates in Congress, and it was between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, and John Quincy Adams became president um, through that. Now, further other amendments that helped, have helped settle these issues so they don't happen again are the 20th and 25th Amendments um, that deal with issues of death and resignation or succession for the presidency and so forth, and have spelled that out. Okay, just a couple more. Um, Non-legislative powers. Um, uh, Congress also has the power to remove any official from office, including all their own members. This is called impeachment. It happens actually, um, it's happened more times than you would think. We just kind of think of it in terms of only limited to presidents because that's, those are the, whole, the, the high profile cases. Now, the House, it's a two-step process. The House will improve impeachment, which means that they're impeached in the House, and then the Senate will actually go through a trial, and then there will be a two-thirds vote, and um, then you would have full impeachment. Now, I know it doesn't have Donald Trump's name on there, um, but we've had so far uh, presidents that have faced impeachment or were going to face impeachment. Andrew Johnson, he survived by one vote. Richard Nixon actually never was impeached. He resigned before it could take place. He was going to be the first one, however. Um, President Bill Clinton was impeached in the House. They went through a full trial, um, and he was not impeached in the Senate, so he was he he was not impeached fully. Um, and then Donald Trump was impeached in the House of Representatives, and then he was not impeached in the Senate. Um, although although they did have a trial, there were no witnesses that were called. Um, in that were new. So it was a little bit kind of a controversial um, decision, depending on which side you were on, but he was not impeached. So those are the histories of our presidents that are a part of it. Now, confirmation, confirmation um, the Senate approves many um, or has the power to approve many different um, appointments by the president, whether it's military officers, um, cabinet members, um, or uh, people that are selected for the Supreme Court. All right, other powers are ratification power. Um, again, the powers that we've talked about in terms of the Congress being able to um, ratify um, ratify treaties, um, 
which helps them shape public policy or foreign policy. Um, and the president can actually, through checks and balances, bypass this with executive agreements. This is something that President Trump likes to do, or at least early on in his presidency he was doing um, a lot more. Um, and this is done through ratification, a two-thirds vote in Congress. And then, like we talked about back in uh, Chapter 3, they have the power in Congress to ratify, or sorry, propose and ratify amendments, with the two-thirds vote being a proposal and three-fourths votes being ratification. And as we all know, amendments are the ability to amend the Constitution or add amendments to the Constitution is the process for change for our government. All right, and then these are just a few videos. If you guys want to look them up, they're just, uh, some of them are news, um, old news stories, um, and some of them are just for fun um, in terms of SNL. But other than that, that's about it. Those are the constitutional powers that our legislation, legislative branch has. And I will see you guys next time in our last lecture to finish out our unit on the legislative branch. You guys have a great day.